Can I have your attention, please? Uh, we're about to start our e afternoon session. I thank you again, all of you. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and your stroll through the gardens. They are beautiful. Let everyone take their seats now. So I hope you had a good and relaxing lunch and were able to um, fellowship with the people that are here. I was talking to Chief Branham earlier and he said, God, it's so good to see everybody face to face again. Uh, and it's good to see all of your faces too. Uh, it's good for tribal people to be together. We're much better together than we are apart. So now, um, this man is, has uh, a long list of uh, accomplishments under his belt and education. But the work that he's doing uh, as the executive director of United South and Eastern Tribes, um, and also the director of the Sovereignty Protection Fund as an advocacy group to advocate for the sovereign rights of tribes made him a perfect keynote speaker for the afternoon and um, kind of like the cherry on top um, of the dessert that we've been eating on today. So without further ado, I would like you to welcome Kiki Carroll, Executive Director of United South and Eastern Tribes. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kitke Carroll. Uh, I am a citizen of the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. And as Chief said, I serve as the executive director for United South Nation Tribes, otherwise known as USET, uh, and the USET Sovereignty Protection Fund. Uh, before I get into my presentation today, uh, which is more of going to be a conversation with you, um, I want to acknowledge and give thanks and gratitude uh, to the tribal nations of this area for uh, giving me the honor and privilege for uh, talking to you and presenting to you today. Uh, and also uh, gratitude and thank you to all my relatives who are out there um, as part of this very important conversation. And normally I'd be sitting here uh, with my coat that I have over there on the back of my chair, but the energy today just called me to put on this t-shirt uh, based upon the way that this conversation went this moment. So I am absolutely honored uh, to be here today. So my goal this afternoon, uh, one of the things that's hard following presenters in the morning is a lot of what I am going to cover was in some ways touched on this morning. Um, but my charge this afternoon is try to pull all that together and then to uh, take it out a couple steps as well um, to talk about the relationship. I will tell you though, it's very difficult to talk about seven centuries of relationship um, in an hour. And when you think about federal Indian policy, and we'll examine that a little bit later as well, uh, it is very complicated, it's very complex, as you already heard this morning. Oftentimes, people compare federal Indian policy and its complexity uh, to the federal tax code uh, as being more complex than that. And there's, it's littered with inconsistencies uh, throughout it. So as my shirt reflects, uh, my goal today is to have a honest and direct conversation with you today about this history and this relationship. But I will tell you, uh, it is a relationship, as was expressed this morning, that most oftentimes is not told in a truthful way, uh, particularly from an indigenous perspective. So I view that as my role not only here today, uh, but as Chief said, uh, my charge with this organization to change that reality is to force honest conversation with the goal and spirit of accomplishing change in this very antiquated uh, paternalistic relationship that exists between the United States uh, and tribal nations. But getting there can be a difficult road. Um, so I'm just going to say to you up front that nothing that I say is meant to disparage, to disrespect, to demean anybody, any group, any entity. Uh, it's all in the spirit of having an honest conversation about all of this. So let me just start with a little information more about uh, our organization. So we were created in 1969. 
uh, our founding members, members were the Eastern Band of Cherokee, the Miccosukee Tribe of Florida, the Mississippi Band of Choctaws, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Uh, those tribal leaders in 1969 had the vision uh, that there was a need for an organization to elevate the voice and interests of tribal nations and indigenous peoples uh, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, we have since grown to 33 fully recognized tribal nations, uh, with the Mid-Atlantic Tribal Nations being our most uh, current uh, newest members uh, to the organization. There are two parts to the work that we do. Uh, one is USET, which is our 501c3. It's the largest division of our organization, which provides programmatic support services to all of our members uh, in the areas of health, uh, economic development, and natural resources. Uh, that office is headquartered out of Nashville, Tennessee, which is central, basically central to this region. Uh, USET Sovereignty Protection Fund is our 501c4, uh, which is headquartered out of Washington, D.C., and that's where we do our policy, legislative, and litigation work. But as you can see from a geographic standpoint, uh, our membership spans from the northeastern woodlands down to the Everglades across the Gulf Coast to eastern Texas. And with the exception of saying eastern Texas, I want to just highlight specifically that when we talk about our geographic footprint, we talk about it from a geographic standpoint, not using state boundaries. Because if we're going to have a conversation about sovereignty, we don't identify ourselves by another sovereign's boundaries. We identify ourselves by where we are in our place in the world. So when we look at the, the footprint of this organization, uh, that's uh, what we encompass. One thing that I want to um, identify that you heard this morning is one of the failures in getting to this place of understanding about this relationship is most history books stopped talking about tribes in 1900. Even in those books where they talk about us, oftentimes we are nothing more than a footnote in that conversation. So our responsibility is to elevate ourselves out of that invisibility to make sure that we have a prominent place in this conversation. And when it comes to the work that we're doing within this organization, so I will tell you as a Native individual who has been in all parts of any country throughout my career, and as a Native person who is from west of the Mississippi, not only do non-Natives not think that there are Indians east of the Mississippi, there are many Natives that don't think that there are Indians east of the Mississippi. So the reason that our organization exists is to make sure that these tribes of first contact, these tribes that have centuries of relationship with the United States and pre the United States, are at the forefront of these conversations, sharing their vision, sharing their experience, sharing their, un their indigenous understanding of this relationship, all in an effort to reframe this relationship in a way that makes sense for the 21st century. So let's start with some of the basics because uh, we throw the word sovereignty around all the time. In its simplest form, sovereignty is the right of a government entity to make decisions that are in the best interest and for the welfare of its citizens. You have responsibilities as elected leaders to your people, to your citizens, to make sure that they have long, healthy, joyful lives. That's a tremendous responsibility. And if you are deprived of any part of that responsibility to exert those sovereign authorities, it makes that responsibility that much more difficult and challenging. So we oftentimes need to hear about this special and this unique relationship. It's special and unique because the relationship, which most people get it wrong, is it's not based upon race. It's not based upon ethnicity. It's not based upon poverty. It's based, as you heard this morning, that there is a unique special relationship that tribes existed as sovereign entities that predate the United States and has been supported in the US Constitution, federal laws, numerous court decisions that are the basis of the relationship that exists in perpetuity, doesn't expire. But unfortunately, people are not taught that. They are not taught that there are three sovereign entities in this country, the first sovereign entity being tribal nations states, the United States. So it's important if we're going to have this conversation about sovereignty, we have to examine it at, from all aspects, which requires us going back to the very beginning uh, of this relationship. Today, as that relationship has evolved over time, 
So we talk about tribal nation U.S. relations. Of course, tribal nations don't exist as a single entity. There are 574 federally recognized tribal nations today that are engaged in this diplomatic dance, this relationship with the United States, which makes it very complex, very complicated, because of course, every sovereign entity has its own views, culture, tradition, practices, understandings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to deal with Indian country as if it exists as a single monolith is ripe for problems. And that's what we're trying to do within the space of evolving this relationship to something that's more reflective of what the relationship should be. I won't repeat this because this was already uh, presented this morning uh, by Dr. Cook. But as I said, most people, when you're talking about the US Constitution, you hear it all the time today. Article this, article that, in the US Constitution, et cetera. What they don't talk about is the recognition of tribes as sovereign entities that predate the United States reflected in the US Constitution. Uh, one of our native uh, citizens who is within the Congress is Tong uh, Congressman Thomas, excuse me, Congressman Cole out of the state of Oklahoma. One of the things that he says repeatedly is that if you are elected to the Senate or Congress and you make that oath to your office, you are pledging allegiance not only to the United States, but you are pledging allegiance and to fight for Indian sovereignty and to protect that. The unfortunate thing though today, if you look at just the House of Representatives by example, the greater majority of them do not have tribes within their jurisdiction. So they know nothing about tribes for the most part. The failure of that though is when it comes time to vote on federal Indian policy, it doesn't matter whether you have tribes in your jurisdiction or not. You are gonna be voting on federal Indian policy. So it's not okay to say that you don't have tribes in your jurisdiction and therefore it doesn't matter to you. And to lift out an example to make that real for you, uh, a handful of years ago, where we are out of the state of Tennessee, and we were having a conversation with one of our senators at the time. And literally within three minutes of this conversation, the senator leans in and says, yes, I've been briefed on this matter, I know all about it, but I don't have Indians in my state, and I don't have tribes in my state. So after a brief pause, leaned into the senator and said, with all due respect, Senator, both of those points are incorrect. Uh, I am a native citizen, and I live in the state of Tennessee. There are also tribes in the state of Tennessee. But even if both of your points were correct, it doesn't excuse you dismissing interest in this issue because you're going to be voting on it. So it's holding them accountable to these responsibilities and obligations that they have. But the important question that you heard this morning, where we spent a lot of time this morning, is how did we get here? How did we end up in this very special, unique relationship with the United States? So let's rewind for a moment. This is all indigenous land. From the northwest quarter to the southwest quarter to the northeast to the Everglades and everything in between was indigenous lands. And that's extremely important that we remember that. And contrary to what history books may tell you, in contrary to what maybe people say to you, this idea that there is just people running around without any vision or direction or structure is nonsense. As you heard this morning already, trade, commerce, sophisticated structures of governance, that was here. So this idea that you see embedded in some of our founding documents that this was just this wild wilderness of people that were disorderly and had no organization is false. But people are taught that from the day that they step into a school system. They are taught that falsehood. So our goal is to correct that. So then what happened? This is a map, a recent map of tribal lands today. All those lands, all the natural resources associated with those lands were taken either through theft, through coercion, forced coercion. So this idea that there was just this this beautiful exchange and there are these settlers that came and there was these agreements and negotiations that were made and that led to this result is also not the complete story either. But this is the result of what happened over that course of time. But here's where I want to pivot to in the conversation. Why did this even happen? How did we end up from a reality where all these lands were indigenous and the result was the theft and loss of so much land and natural resources. 
1492. This is a letter from Christopher Columbus identifying what he saw. Generous. Give their hearts. So what he's reporting back is a people who are not warlike, who are not looking to enter into battle. He's reporting back compassion, empathy, understanding that we are all in this together. That's what he's reporting back. But as you heard this morning mentioned is the doctrine of discovery. So let me just dig into that a little bit further. This is the basis to everything. And this is critically important to understanding the relationship today. This is not something that happened centuries and centuries ago that has no relevance today. This has absolute relevance today because it's embedded in everything. So basically what this says is it gave permission to Christian explorers that as you set across the globe and encountered new lands, new to them, that the people you encountered in those lands were not Christian, you had the right to take those lands. You had the right to de dispossess those individuals of their possessions. And that's exactly what they did. You see this, this sort of artwork depicted everywhere. History books, US capitals, state houses, this idea of planting your flag as if that gives you possession because you, quote unquote, discovered it and because the people there were not worthy of occupancy. So what happened after this? So this idea of these people that weren't warlike when they first were encountered turned into a doctrine that allowed them to take possession of these lands. And that's exactly what they did. And they justified those actions, those inhumane actions, those crimes against humanity, to allow them to take possession. And these quotes reflect that. Making slaves of our children, of our wives, of our women, commanding them to do what they're supposed to do. And if they didn't do it, dismembering them, killing them. So we all hear about the Christopher Columbus story. But what's left off in that story is that man was sent back to Spain and chained three different times for the atrocities that he committed in the Americas. But to this day, we still celebrate in many parts of this country Christopher Columbus as a revered hero who discovered America. But we're not honest about what actually took place. But that's at the core, that's at the root. You fast forward, and I'm not gonna cover this period of time because it was already covered extensively this morning, to colonial settlement. And you heard uh, words this morning of subordination, slaves, uh, refusal to accept tribal sovereignty, dispossession, expressed English land ownership. This was the next chapter in that story. What occurred in this region is part of that continued pattern and part of that continued story. Fast forward a little bit beyond that to the Declaration of Independence or the Declaration of the United States. Just read these words and just let them sit with you for a minute. Truths that are supposedly self-evident that we're all equal, yet except the very people who occupy the lands here. So, here we have people from across the water coming here to flee persecution, then persecuting the very people who are here. Creating a government structure that talks about freedom and liberty and rights and equality, yet depriving the very people who are here of the very same thing that they're pursuing for themselves. The hypocrisy of that is, not, is beyond words but it's what we're dealing with if we're going to understand this. So as they're taking possession of these lands, as they're taking natural resources, as they're killing indigenous peoples, they throw in words that we're the, we're the merciless savages. We're the ones committing warfare. Then they talk about England, if we're having this conversation about this part of the country, the crown exciting domestic insurrections, 
endeavor to bring on the inhabitants uh, to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers. So the irony in all this is the very things that they were trying to accomplish for themselves, they were robbing us as indigenous peoples of. Skipped over one. But I go back to my initial premise. You do that when you don't view us, our relatives, indigenous peoples, as human beings. Dispossessing us of our lands and our assets and killing us you do when you don't view us as an equal entity. You don't view us as a human. Chief Standing Bear, um, Ponca tribe of Nebraska, the, the Northern Ponca were one of the tribes that were removed as many tribes were removed during the federal Indian policy eras of removal. Um, without getting into the, the details of the whole story, uh, when the Northern Ponca were moved down to Oklahoma territory, uh, Chief Standing Bear's son died. And his dying wish was to be returned to his homelands in Nebraska, in Nebraska to be buried. Well, just shy of returning to Nebraska, getting back to the homelands, uh, he was caught. Um, and he was arrested and tried in court. The reason why this is significant to this conversation about humanity and, and who we are is prior to this case, um, make sure I get the date right, 1879 in a court in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, which is where I spent about 20 years of my life. And I worked for the Ponkas, by the way, uh, in part of my career as well. Prior to this court decision, natives weren't even considered human beings. It was this case in 1879 that was the first time in US law that we as native peoples were even recognized as human beings. It was several decades later, in 1924, when we were even recognized as citizens. So this isn't far off in our history. This is yesterday. In the, in the greater scheme of things, this is yesterday, this history. This quote is in, in this statue of Standing Bear. Uh, it actually now stands in the rotunda of the US Capitol. Uh, each state has the ability to put two statues of individuals from their states of significance. Uh, a couple years back, the state of Nebraska uh, decided to remove one of their statues and replace it with a statue of Chief Standing Bear due to the significant role that he played um, in our history. But let's rewind because one of the things that we're taught about is leaders throughout the formation of this country leaders that we revere, leaders that we hear about in our history books, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a pattern that started with the Doctrine of Discovery, that started with Christopher Columbus, that made its way all the way to the present day. And these are just a few uh, presidents that I pulled some quotes out of. But look at the language that they're using with, about us. An unfortunate race trying to save and civilize us. Our ferocious barbarities. Getting old in my glasses. Need them. They have neither the intelligence, the industry, moral habits, nor the desire of improvement, which are essential to any favorable change in their condition. But just to show you that it's not just our initial founders, President Abraham Lincoln, who is oftentimes a re celebrated as a revered social justice advocate, President, Emancipation Proclamation. He too. Ronald Reagan. Uh, let me tell you just a little something about the American Indians in our land. We have provided millions of acres of land to us. And we've done everything we can to meet their demands. Maybe we should have said, no, come join us, be citizens along with the rest of us. On January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Probably everybody in this room took a history test that had to answer that question. What you weren't taught in your history book, six days prior to that, at President Lincoln's directive on December 26th, 1862, 38 Dakota men were hanged. It was the largest mass hanging in United States history. The hangings and convictions of the Dakota 38 resulted from the aftermath of, U of the U.S. Dakota War 
1862 in southwest Minnesota. Lincoln's treatment of defeated Indian rebels against the United States stood in sharp, sharp contrast to his treatment of the Confederate rebels. So 400 Union soldiers were killed during the Civil War. 38 Dakota men, and none of them were hung. 38 Dakota men were hung for rebelling. But you have to ask yourself, rebelling for what? To protect their families? To protect their lands? To protect their way of life? That's wrong. And the consequence of fighting for what you believe in to protect who you are and everything that you're about is punishable by death. But that's what resulted. But we don't tell that story honestly in our history books. We cover that up as if it didn't happen. But it's part of the story. It's what every indigenous person feels when we have these conversations because we know about that truth. And we get frustrated because it's not shared. Short video. The whole relation between the Indian tribes and the United States is the most ridiculous possible. And I hope someday or other, a gentleman familiar with the subject will bring in a bill abolishing the whole system. This glorification of the Indian character and the poetic tale of his wrongs inflicted by this government in the purchase of their lands is a phantom of the poetic brain. We have paid to these Indians and invested for their benefit millions in money if they refuse to merge into and become part of the superior race. They must necessarily be destroyed. It is a law of humanity. A law of humanity. In our founding documents, we're the savages. We're the merciless ones. This isn't just in this long time ago period. This has relevance today. This has relevance to every single one of you, Middle Atlantic tribal nations sitting in this room. This idea of racial superiority in one race having rights over another is embedded in your story. It still lingers over you. It hovers over you. It's part of the challenges that you have had within this diplomacy space. So you can't have a conversation about sovereignty without having a correlating conversation about justice. Because that's what's embedded in this. So when we look at the work that our organization does, so yes, it's about supporting our tribal nations, it's helping them evolve as tribal governance and become more mature and sophisticated, all those sorts of things. It's also about trying to advance federal Indian policy in the most favorable way to tribal nations so they are in the best position to exert their inherent rights and authorities. But you cannot have that conversation without talking about how racial injustice overlaps with all of that and how it impacts that effort as well. This is at the US Capitol in Washington, DC. It's called the Progress of Civilization. And it sits aside, uh, above the Senate doors of the um, U.S. Capitol. Captain Montgomery C. Miggs, the supervising engineer of the Capitol Extension Project, wrote in 1853 explaining his worldview. In our history of the struggle between civilized man and the savage, between the cultivated and the wild nature, are certainly to be found themes worthy of the artist and capable of appealing to the feelings of all classes. The pediment illustrates the expansion of Western civilization with its tools, knowledge, and values and the associated demise of indigenous people through the eyes of the colonizer. 2021, this is still sitting above our US Capitol. You heard this morning uh, talking about some of the key US Supreme Court cases. But the tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. To leave them in possession of the country was to leave the country a wilderness. This is a recent case, U.S. versus uh, Velour in 2004, 
These are quotes by Chief Thomas, Clarence Thomas, who was questioning this whole premise and idea of tribal sovereignty and what that actually means. So why do I start out with this in my presentation? It's because all of this is the foundation to what's led up to where we are in the relationship today. What has shaped this the relationship today, as I mentioned before, are numerous judicial decisions, congressional statutes, federal actions, whatever, that have shaped the understanding today. But even though it's the 21st century, 2021, the foundation of the relationship, as you heard this morning, is still extremely paternalistic, it's extremely antiquated, and it's time for its erasure in order for tribes to continue to evolve and to, to nation rebuild in the way that we need to for our future generations. But before I pivot, I want to just again remind people, this relationship is not based on race, poverty, ethnicity. It's based on tribes seeding many, many millions of acres of land and natural resources. Those lands and natural resources are part of the very foundation of this country, and they are part of the, the foundation of the wealth, strength, and power of this country. But most people don't recognize that. They view the work that goes on in country as something different from that reason, because they're not told that and they're not taught that. So Kevin Gover was the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs during the Clinton administration, and he wrote a Natural Resource Journal article about 15 years ago. And he was talking about the trust relationship, the relationship that you heard about this morning. That relationship, which is still the model today, is based on two things, that we as Indian people are incompetent to handle our own affairs, and two, that we're eventually just going to go away anyways. Both of those have been proven to be flawed. But despite that, there has not been a correction to that. So one of the things from an advocacy standpoint that our organization is engaged in is trying to evolve this flawed, antiquated, um, unjust trust model to something that's more accurate and appropriate for today in that relationship. Just think about the word itself, trust, and how you use that term in your own dealings. If you have a financial trustee, it's because you are asking somebody else to handle your finances who you expect to be much more knowledgeable in that area than yourself. That's what we're basically saying here, that tribes don't have the intelligence or ability to handle our own affairs, so therefore we need another sovereign entity to take care of us. That's not sovereignty. Sovereignty is our leaders taking care of our citizens and making decisions. And the important thing to talk about with sovereignty, when you're having a conversation about sovereignty as well, this idea that there's some sort of perfect sovereign that exists out there, let me let, me let the secret out of the bag. There has never been a perfect sovereign in the history of the world. Part of sovereignty is not only the right to make good decisions, it's the right to make bad decisions to which you hopefully grow and evolve from. But all of you tribal leaders in this room, is that the standard that you're held to? Your st standard you're held to is perfection. If you're going to get a federal dollar, you better plan for it appropriately, you better report on it appropriately, and you better spend it appropriately. And if you don't, there's going to be a consequence, and you may not get dollars again. That's not what sovereignty is supposed to be about. You're supposed to be able to make those decisions and learn from those decisions along the way. And the United States is not immune from that as well. The United States has made its fair share of mistakes over its course of its, its history as well. You heard this morning, again, I'll repeat though because it is a critically important point. When the U.S. was being formed, the initial relationship was based on this notion of tribes as sovereigns were ceding certain resources or ceding certain rights. And anything that they did not cede 
they were retaining for themselves. What happened over time, as the United States grew in power, and you, you heard that treaty making ended in the late 1800s, that also times with as the United States was growing in power. So its need to have strong domestic relations was different than what the needs were in the early part of its history. So what it started doing is it turned this corner from, we're not ceding, we're not understanding this as ceding rights, it's granting you rights. And this becomes a sticking point in negotiations right now that are actively happening with the United States in the legislative space. You have congressional members who will take the position that they are granting us authorities and rights. And what tribal leaders push back and say is, you're not granting us anything. You are recognizing rights and authorities that are inherently ours. That is a critical difference in understanding. I was having a conversation at lunch this morning, uh, this afternoon, about this next item, Indian Kansas of Construction, which basically is, as all these laws and statutes are being put in place, if something is unclear, that should be interpreted, interpreted to our favor, to our benefit, to our interest. You already heard this morning about how we and the United States came to the negotiation table and how the Crown came to the table in those negotiations and maybe a fundamental dis this difference of understanding about how you are approaching those negotiations. Right now, tribal leaders are being bombarded with consultation opportunities, and they are critically important, so I don't want to be dismissive of them. Making sure that in this diplomatic relationship with the United States, that actions aren't being taken without consulting us to understand the impacts that those will have to our communities and to our people is critically important. But to a comment that you heard this morning, consultation is not the goal. Consent is the goal. But the idea of consent is not something new. You heard that this morning. Consent was part of the relationship at the very beginning. But as time expired, it changed to this idea of consultation. What we promote organizationally is yes, consultation should occur, occur. We expect all federal entities to consult with tribal nations to make sure that anything that's going to impact tribal lands, tribal people, tribal interests, that we should be part of that process and things shouldn't just be happening to us. But the failure of that is that even though there are consultations that happen, actions still happen despite our preferences on our lands that affect our people. So again, if we're going to have a conversation about sovereignty, the answer is consent. So U.S. tribal leaders agree to something that's going to happen to you and your community. And if you don't agree, it shouldn't happen. And you all understand the numerous examples that have happened within that space uh, over time. One of the things that's been going on in a complementary sort of space uh, is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And that is the ultimate goal is for tribal nations as sovereign entities to have a seat at the table as nation states, just like any other sovereign entity. One of the things that's embedded in that is the principle of consent, free informed prior consent. That is not something that's new. It's something that we are trying, though, to force in the conversation as we're trying to reach uh, this place of uh, greater sovereignty, respect, and understanding. Uh, this is just a quote from an article that uh, I wrote with our USET SPF policy director a handful of years ago, uh, making our case for moving away from a consultation model uh, to a consent model. So let's talk about the funding tied to this for a moment. This is the first one is from Cohen's Handbook of Federal Indian Law. Trust responsibility consists of the highest moral obligations that the United States must meet to ensure the protection of tribal and individual lands, asset, resources, and treaty, and similarly recognized rights. The federal trust obligation in our sacred relationship with the United States government sets tribal nations and their citizens apart from all other American citizens. So let's back up for a minute and think about diplomacy and what that means from sovereign to sovereign and not talk about Indian country for a second. When you think about um, 
diplomacy between the United States and other nations and foreign aid spending by example that we send to other sovereigns. Do you think they, need, they have grant writers writing a grant to get those resources? Do you think they're doing quarterly reporting for resources that this country gives to other sovereigns internationally? Of course not. But we are being handled through a grants sort of framework. But to understand that, you have to understand that it's because embedded in that is not a recognition of sovereignty. It's a view that we are a membership group, a club, an entity, a not-for-profit. Grants processes are for the not-for-profit space. Right? So as a not-for-profit organization, yes, we have to make our case that there's a need. We have to make our logic model. We have to present our case. We have to secure the funding, spend the funding well, report on the funding, have the outcomes, et cetera. That's par for the course for not-for-profit. It shouldn't be par for the course for fulfilling, for fulfilling trust and treaty obligations, but it is. That's what tribes have to do all the time. So what that does is it, it puts tribes in a position of having to compete against one another to access the very funds that should be coming them as a response to, again, that session of land and natural resources that are the basis of that relationship. The other part of that is that Indian country funding is on a discretionary basis. So for those of you who aren't perhaps federal budget wonks in the room, what that simply means is every single year, all these tribal leaders sitting here in the front row will have to go to Washington, D.C. and plead their case to the United States for the United States to honor its promises to Indian country through its discretionary decision-making authority. Where our position is, it shouldn't be a discretion, dis discretionary decision. It should be mandatory. The United States should, from a mandatory standpoint, fulfill those trust and treaty obligations as its first action. And why? Again, because we were the first peoples here. All those lands and natural resources became the foundation of the wealth and strength of the United States. I don't think it's much to ask to fulfill that promise. That fourth bullet point there, the Office of Management and Budget reports to the United States Congress on an annual basis that they appropriate roughly 21 billions of dollars to Indian country in fulfillment of that trust and treaty responsibility. What they don't tell you is a portion of that are dollars that tribes are eligible for. So whether you actually receive any of those monies is anybody's guess. And that's based usually on the relationship that a tribal nation has with its specific state. So if you have a strong relationship with your state and you're eligible for funding through that state, you may see some of those funds. If you are a tribal nation, your dollars are coming through a state that you are not on good terms with, there's a greater likelihood that you're not going to see a dime of those dollars. But when they report that to Congress, they're reporting the larger number. And again, this is just a, a case that uh, further supported what I spoke to earlier, that Indian country funding is not race-based. It's in fulfillment of this recognition of nation-to-nation, government-to-government, sovereign-to-sovereign uh, relationship. So I'm not going to delve into that because of time limitations. This is expressed as a graph here. 34.6 trillion is the value assigned to all U.S. lands uh, and some of the natural resource revenue derived off of those lands. $34.6 trillion. Again, those lands and natural resources were indigenous lands and natural resources. You compare that, and that's an updated figure from the $21 billion that I mentioned a moment ago. You compare that to the annual appropriation for Indian country, that represents less than one-tenth of one percent. Less than one-tenth of one percent we're having to fight on an annual basis, on a daily basis for that matter, to get the United States to fulfill and honor its promises. This is uh, some recent figures, they're a little dated right now, uh, but this just puts it in comparison to some of the dollars that we invest uh, in other places around the world uh, through our foreign aid spending. But I want you to pay close attention to that last bullet point uh, on this slide. So if you've been watching the news, uh, you have seen reported uh, that for the 20 years that we spent 
on the war in Afghanistan, and I'm not making a comment on the war. I'm simply talking about the war in Afghanistan and the costs associated with that is estimated at $2 trillion is what we spent over the course of a 20-year occupation in Afghanistan. If you use the $21 billion reported by OMB over that same 20-year period of time, that's roughly $400 billion that's been appropriated in fulfillment of trust and treaty obligations to 574 federally recognized tribes compared to $2 trillion appropriated for one sovereign. Just let that sit in for a minute. So we're willing to spend $2 trillion for an effort miles and miles away, but for what's going on right here domestically, we're not fulfilling those promises. That's despicable. That's a tragedy. And it's a tragedy that needs to be highlighted and told over and over and over. Because again, most people don't know about this. They don't understand this. In 2013, the United States Commission on Civil Rights issued a report called the Quiet Crisis Report. And what it did was an examination on whether the United States was fulfilling those promises. That 2013 report reported out that the United States was doing a terrible job in fulfilling those promises. You fast forward 15 years, I think I said 2003, I meant 2003, I apologize. 15 years later in 2018, they updated that report with the Broken Promises Report. That report reported that since that initial report 15 years ago, not only were we continuing as a country to fail in fulfilling those promises, we were failing worse than 15 years prior. So we're not even making progress with the passage of time. And what I have bolded here is one of the powerful quotes from that report. The United States expects all nations to live up to their treaty obligations it should live up to its own. It should live up to its own. So why do these failures matter? So if we're going to have this conversation about the origins and what that led to and what the basis of the relationship is now and whether or not the United States is fulfilling those promises or not, why does any of this matter? Well, uh, several years ago, uh, there was a photographer by the name of Aaron Huey. Um, and he was, his initial intention was just to take some photographs of some of what was going on within any country. Well, what oftentimes happens when somebody actually puts themselves into our space to learn, to grow, and to be aware, there's an awakening that happens. Because absent those opportunities, they are never uh, presented with those opportunities. And this is just a brief clip from I'm sure many of you are familiar with a TED Talk uh, that he did uh, after he um, embarked on this uh, photographic photography journey. Statistics about native population today, more than a century after the massacre at Wounded Knee, reveal the legacy of colonization, forced migration, and treaty violations. Unemployment on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation fluctuates between 85 and 90%. The housing office is unable to build new structures, and existing structures are falling apart. Many are homeless, and those with homes are packed into rotting buildings with up to five families. 39% of homes on Pine Ridge have no electricity. At least 60% of the homes on the reservation are infested with black mold. More than 90% of the population lives below the federal poverty line. The tuberculosis rate on Pine Ridge is approximately eight times higher than the U.S. national average. The infant mortality rate is the highest on this continent and is about three times higher than the U.S. national average. Cervical cancer is five times higher than the U.S. national average. The school dropout rate is up to 70 percent. Teacher turnover is eight times higher than the U.S. national average. Frequently, grandparents are raising their grandchildren because parents due to alcoholism, domestic violence, and general apathy, cannot raise them. 50% of the population over the age of 40 suffers from diabetes. The life expectancy for men is between 46 and 48 years old, roughly the same as Afghanistan and Somalia. The last chapter in any successful genocide is the one in which the oppressor <laughs> 
can remove their hands and say, my God, what are these people doing to themselves? They're killing each other. They're killing themselves while we watch them die. This is how we came to own these United States. This is the legacy of Manifest Destiny. Prisoners are still born into prisoner of war camps long after the guards are gone. These are the bones left after the best meat has been taken. A long time ago, a series of events was set in motion by a people who look like me, by Washichu, eager to take the land and the water and the gold in the hills. Those events led to a domino effect that has yet to end. As removed as we, the dominant society, may feel from a massacre in 1890 or a series of broken treaties 150 years ago, I still have to ask you the question, how should you feel about the statistics of today? What is the connection between these images of suffering and the history that I just read to you? And how much of this history do you need to own even? Is any of this your responsibility today? I have been told that there must be something we can do. There must be some call to action. Because for so long I've been standing on the sidelines, content to be a witness, just taking photographs. Because the solution seems so far in the past, I needed nothing short of a time machine to access them. The suffering of indigenous peoples is not a simple issue to fix. It's not something everyone can get behind the way they get behind helping Haiti or ending AIDS or fighting a famine. The fix, as it's called, may be much more difficult for the dominant society than, say, a $50 check or a church trip to paint some graffiti-covered houses or a suburban family donating a box of clothes they don't even want anymore. So where does that leave us? Shrugging our shoulders in the dark? The United States continues on a daily basis to violate the terms of the 1851 and 1868 Fort Laramie treaties with the Lakota. The call to action I offer today, my Ted wish is this. Honor the treaties, give back the Black Hills. It's not your business what they do with them. Pine Ridge is what, but one example. This can be repeated over many other times, many other examples that all of you are all too familiar with. And that only rewinds back to 150 years. You've already heard this morning that this relationship goes way further back in the mid-1800s. But despite all this, despite intentional efforts of assimilation, termination, genocide, any country has persevered. And as you've heard this morning, we are still here and we aren't going anywhere. We are at a moment in our history where we are reclaiming our righteous place in our own lands. And that may be uncomfortable for some, but that's what justice looks like. That's what sovereignty means. This symposium is about sovereignty, about exerting those rights and authorities. We are only able to do that when we take those actions assertively, aggressively, knowing that there are going to be challenges to that. It's embedded from our very first days. There's always going to be challenges by other entities to our sovereignty. Because for many of them, they don't even believe in it. I was going to play a video, but I know I'm running out of time, correct? Is that the sign I just got in the back of the room? No, OK. I'm going to play one quick video um, before I wrap things up here. This was a video that was done by the National Congress of American Indians a handful of years ago. Uh, it was done directly in response to uh, the Washington football team, which you're all probably familiar with in this part of the country, and the debate that was raging over the team's name. One thing I just want to say about that, to make that issue relative to the work that we do, that term is origins 
is actually from our region. So when you talk about colonial times uh, and the, the intentional effort to wipe native peoples off of these lands, that included bounties. And what these bounties were paid for was to go seek out Penobscot natives and to prove that they accomplished their task and to get paid for that, they had to bring back those bloody scalps. That is the origin of that name of that team. So for anybody to say to you in that debate when it was raging on that it was an expression of respect doesn't know their history. But this was a piece that was done uh, to celebrate, despite all of this story, despite the heaviness of this story, that we are still here, we are still strong, we are still proud, we are vibrant, we are rebuilding, all of those things. We are very proud to be Native Indigenous peoples. And this is our moment to reclaim that. In this video, even though it was done for the Washington football issue, just highlights the beauty of what Indian country is. Proud, forgotten, Indian. Navajo, Blackfoot, Inuit, and Sioux. Survivor, spiritualist, patriot. Sitting Bull, Hiawatha, and Jim Thorpe. Mother, father, son, daughter, chief. Apache, Pueblo, Choctaw, Chippewa, and Crow. Underserved, struggling, resilient. Squanto, Red Cloud, Tecumseh, and Crazy Horse. Rancher, teacher, doctor, soldier. Seminole, Seneca, Mohawk, and Creek. Mills, Will Rogers, Geronimo. Unyielding, strong, indomitable. Native Americans call themselves many things. The one thing they don't. So in closing, while many may take the position that the expiration of time in progress that we have made as a society over the years has properly addressed and resolved the damage from these periods, it is my position that it has not. The result has been multi-generational historical trauma, continued institutionalized racism, health and social disparities, the marginalization and visibility of Native peoples. Additionally, this untold story has direct correlation to the many disparities and injustices that we continue to see across our society today more generally. Disparities that should not exist in the most wealthy nation the world has ever known. Injustices that should not exist in a nation that proclaims liberty and justice for all. However, despite the truths of our past, despite our continued challenges, we have the gift of opportunity and the power of choice a choice to be better than we have been, to be better than we are, but it requires us as a nation, as individuals to take full ownership and accountability of our past, to be truthful and honest with that past, and to understand how this past has played a role throughout our history and how it continues to play a role today. We lack a common understanding of where we come from, and this lack directly interferes with our ability to forge ahead with a common cause and a common purpose. While it is important to have greater awareness, understanding, and respect for that which distinguishes us from one another, more importantly, we must find a way to focus on that which binds us in common as children of the Creator, as fellow human beings, as global citizens, as citizens of this great democratic, democratic experiment who are all deserved of human rights, equal opportunity, 
dignity, and respect. In doing so, we will begin to move beyond the other mentality that, that separates and divides us and replace it with the Lakota concept of metakia yoyasin, meaning we are all related. As part of our continued evolution as a country, as a people, the time has arrived for an awakening or reawakening of consciousness. Moral indifference can no longer be tolerated, and while moral outrage may feel good, we must redirect that energy into moral courage as is greater value and necessity. Until we see a bit of ourselves in each other, until we share a common understanding of our journey as a nation, I do believe that we are better than this. The time is long past due for our nation to achieve truth and reconciliation with the stains on its character and integrity. It is long past due for the promises made to us long ago to be honored and fulfilled. How well the United States honors its promises to this land's first people, how well it honors its trust and treaty obligations is ultimately the foundational the measure of its exceptionalism. Full recognition and respect for the inherent sovereign authorities and rights of tribal nations is key to our nation rebuilding efforts. While past policies of termination and assimilation cannot be undone, our local, state, and federal partners have the opportunity to do their part to fully support our nation rebuilding efforts. At the individual level, each of you have the opportunity to demand nothing less than justice for this land's first people as an expression of correcting these historical wrongs. Ultimately, it is not a question about possibility, but whether there is, a, is the necessary will and desire. It is time to evolve from federal Indian policy as a colonial construct and lead with tribal nation law and policy as a true expression of our sovereignty. Strong tribal nations lead to a stronger America. Thank you.